the hymn which is in front of you. Stand with me. We'll turn to hymn number 357. Hymn number 357, Work for the Night is Coming. Work for the night is coming. Work through the morning hours. Work while the dew is sparkling. Work mid springing flowers. Work when the day grows brighter. Work in the growing sun. Work for the night is coming. When man's work is done, work for the night is coming. Work through the sunny noon. Fill brightest days with labor. Rest comes sure and soon. Give every flying minute something to keep in store. Work for the night is coming. Works no more. Work for the night is coming under the sunset skies. While their bright tents are glowing, work for daylight flies. Work till the last beam fadeth, fadeth to shine no more. Work for the night is dark. When man's work is old. Well, it's good to see you on the midweek, Wednesday evening service. And I was down uh, just kind of checking the other parts of the building as I was coming in. And the kids running all over the place. And the praise the Lord for full buses. I love to see uh, when the buses come in and absolutely full of kids. So let's make sure we're praying tonight for our children's ministry, our ministry 226. Uh, I watched as our Spanish church was moving songbooks, and I saw some first-time Spanish guests tonight. So excited about that. Uh, and then, uh, as always, uh, our regular master club and other things. So uh, never forget, while we're listening to the Word of God in here, be praying for the ministry of the gospel. Now, this week, we've had people saved at visitation. Uh, we've had people saved in our children's ministry. Had a little girl saved in Sunday school. Uh, just been awesome already what the Lord's done. And it's just midweek. You know, the world looks at Wednesday like hump day. Like, oh, if we can just get through this day and get through till the weekend. Though Everybody's working for the weekend. Uh, but for the believer, you know, every day is a good day when you know the Lord. And uh, you can be a witness. You can be a blessing. And I'm excited about tonight. A uh, special guest preacher. I'm looking forward to hearing him. And uh, always glad to hear the word of God. Uh, uh, Brother Greg, y'all know Brother Greg and I have a, a pretty good relationship, give and take. Uh, I said, well, Brother Chris is going to preach tonight. And uh, Brother Greg's like, well, great. We get to hear some good preaching for a change. Amen. And with that kind of encouragement in your membership and your friends, you don't need any enemies. But uh, we're thrilled that you're here tonight. And I hope you receive a blessing. Uh, I hope God speaks to your need. Listen, everybody who comes to church has a need, has a burden, has something. And uh, so let's pray uh, that the Lord will speak to our needs. And then we'll go to prayer time. And uh, we'll share some requests. Uh, how many of you would like to know what the offering was on Sunday? Uh, how many of you don't care a bit? You don't care about any kind of giving? You don't care what's going on? Uh, you know, we had a matching gift offering, and uh, we matched dollar for dollar money that came in uh, for building fund, for ministry expenses, all these things that we're doing around here. And uh, I want to rejoice with you. And, you know, I never set goals. I learned a long time ago, if you set a goal and you don't hit it, you're disappointed. If you set a goal and maybe you miss it by just a little bit, uh, or you, you hit it and you think, well, why didn't I set a higher goal? So I don't set goals. Whatever God does, God does. Uh, if we got, got $15,000 came in to be matched, I would rejoice. That would be $30,000. i would rejoice. Uh, if we got 20000 that came in to match, I'd be thrilled. I mean, I'd be absolutely thrilled. Uh, if 25,000, which I didn't set a goal, but I thought, well, that'd be a neat, a neat number, because then you'd have a matching 25, be a $50,000 offering. No, I'd be, I'd be thrilled. Dance. You'll dance. <laughs> Thank you, God. Amen. Uh, if we had a $30,000 matching goal, uh, I, I would dance with you. Amen. Uh, but uh, we matched over. And I'm not the mathematician, Brother Dan, Brother Paul, these guys do all the numbers. But we matched over $32,000 in giving. 
on Sunday. Now, more has come in since then. Uh, all total this week, uh, God has blessed our church with an unbelievable. And you know what? That's a testimony. We didn't pressure. We didn't push. We just said, here's an opportunity to make ministry better here. And God's people responded. That's the way I want to be in a ministry where there's no pressure, no guilt. Just do what you can do and let God do the rest. But uh, almost, and again, I, 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 that's why I was talking to them, make sure. But uh, almost a $90,000 week. We had a huge missions gift. We had a tremendous regular giving and just a huge week for the Lord. And immediately now we're ready to move forward with other ministry plans. And so you praise the Lord with me for almost a $90,000 week. That's a blessing. Uh, but 32000 uh, in matching funds. And so we praise the Lord. And then the individual, and that individual would just die. And I'll never say, nobody will ever know, but it's that kind of spirit that makes this a great church. It's that kind of spirit. The attitude, uh, just, just, um, just the, the just quiet, Christ-like spirit. And uh, somebody, some of you say, you know, Pastor, if I had it, I'd give it. That's the same spirit. It's the same spirit. It's not equal gift. It's equal sacrifice. And for this person, that's what they could do. And what you were able to do, that's what you're able to do. And we rejoice in that. And we praise the Lord. And I promise you, we'll, we'll try our best to minister uh, well with that and uh, reach more kids, reach more opportunities for Christ. Uh, but we rejoice. All right, tonight, if this is your first time or first time in a very long time at Community Bible Baptist, we certainly want to welcome you. And it looks like we have a few faces that are new tonight. We thank you for being here. And so, ushers, if you'd make sure that we get a visitor pack, good to have each of you. And if you just slip your hand up, we want to make sure we welcome you folks. Good to have some folks back here. God bless you. And, uh, sir, good to have you. What a blessing to see you, Brother Steve, right there. And uh, right to your left, Brother Steve. And uh, everybody's. Now, this lady, I don't know who she is. Uh, I think I've seen her before, but what a blessing to see Charlotte here tonight. And uh, you look great, Charlotte. Praise the Lord. How, how's the report? What's the word right now? Still, still health-wise, are the doctors pleased with your development so far? Let's, let's make sure that when we pray for Charlotte, she's, she wants to have opportunity now, the Lord, to open the door for a transplant. So let's pray about that with her, and the Lord open up a donor. Uh, but we rejoice. You know, we honored Charlotte this year at our Single Vision Conference, and the other lady that we honored, both were going through physical trauma. Of course, both single adult ladies who've served the Lord so faithfully. But we got that word a couple of weeks ago uh, that that dear woman is cancer free now. And so, you know what? The Lord answers prayer. And let's keep praying for Miss Charlotte and uh, this other dear missionary. I, um, her name is drawing a blank for some reason. Anybody remember? Uh, I'm sorry? Gail. It was Gail. Thank you very much. And uh, Miss Gail from Wisconsin. And so we rejoice over that. Let's do this. Miss Rebecca, would you play through something for us? If you don't recognize a face in the auditorium, go find a new friend. Introduce yourself. And let's get ready for the preaching of the Word of God. God bless you. We're glad you're here.
let's find our place. How many of you know that little chorus, Hallelujah, Thine the Glory? It's simple, simple, simple. Let's see if we can sing that together. Find that chorus, Miss Rebecca. Hallelujah, Thine the Glory. You may be seated and uh, rejoicing what the Lord is doing uh, in our church and our ministries. And boy, just got uh, so many good reports. Last night, uh, got a report from John Allen. John's one of our single adult men. And uh, he and Brother David Hall went out to follow up on a fellow they met Saturday. And uh, they tried to witness to the fellow Saturday. Didn't get saved. But John Allen called him last night and said they won the man to Christ at his home last night. And John Allen was high as a kite. I mean, just stirred up for the Lord. And then we got reports today. Uh, Brother Kevin just told me they found nothing, nothing on his pancreas. And they found a big mass in the test and uh, after tests and results, uh, nothing there. Now he said, Pastor, I still have kidney stones, but no mass on the pancreas. So one out of two ain't bad. Amen. But uh, listen, we pray and then we ought to praise when God does answer prayer. Uh, Take your Bibles tonight. And uh, I was uh, uh, excited. My brother-in-law is the assistant pastor at Calvary Baptist Church in Red Bank, Tennessee. And, uh, you know, we lived in Texas for 12 years and nobody wanted to ever come spend time with us. But boy, we moved to St. Petersburg, Florida. And everybody <laughs> loves us now. Amen. But uh, they're going to bring, uh, they wanted to bring the girls down for some time. And we just love that. Uh, our kids and, and the cousins get to play together. And so when we found out they were coming, got so excited. Chris and I, not only are we brother in laws, but we're very, very close friends in ministry. And let me tell you, there is a great joy when your family serves the Lord with you. And uh, we get to talk about the ministry. Today we talked about ministry stuff and just comparing notes, learning from him. He's taking some stuff back uh, from us, and I'm going to take some stuff from him. And uh, Chris is an outstanding preacher. He's doing a great work there. Pastor uh, Dwight uh, there at Red Bank, and we praise the Lord for him. His wife Jessica, four beautiful little girls. And uh, he's a great preacher. I had the privilege to go up uh, this year to be part of his ordination. And uh, so you listen well tonight, Brother Chris. You come and uh, you open God's word to us. And then after Brother Chris preaches, we'll have our prayer time uh, and uh, our request time. Brother Chris, you come. Thank you. If you would open your Bible to 2 Timothy, I mean 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2. Thanks to uh, Brent for asking me to to, uh, preach tonight. Uh, I always like to... uh, offer to do that if I'm here, if, he, if I can help him out. I know it's sometimes it's good to have a break every now and then. It can, uh, it can be overbearing sometimes studying all the time. So uh, I hope I can be a blessing to you. We got to play golf today, and uh, that made me think of this joke, okay? There was this preacher, <clears throat> and he was uh, new to a town. He was coming down the road, and he saw a little kid sitting out in the yard, and there was a little push lawn mower out there, and it was like 15 bucks. The preacher was surprised at the price, so he asked the kid, hey, is that... Is that really, is that your lawnmower? He said, yeah, it is. He said, is it really $15? He said, yes, sir. And he said, "Uh, does it run? He said, sure, yeah, it runs. He said, $15 is all you want. Yeah, that's all I want. He said, well, I I just moved here. I I need one. I'm going to buy it from you. Okay, deal is done. A few days later, he goes, uh, the little boy's walking down the road, and he comes by, and he sees the preacher out in the yard pulling the cord on the lawnmower, just yanking on it. I mean, yanking, yanking, sweat's dripping. How many of you have ever been there before? Can I get an amen? Yeah. He's yanking on the thing, yanking on it, sweat's dripping. He's obviously getting a little bit aggravated. And, and he takes a break for a second. As the kid walks by, he sees him. And he's like, hey, hey, are you that kid that I bought that lawnmower, this lawnmower from? He said, yes, sir. He said, you told me it ran. He says, it done. He, it does run. He said, well, I've been cranking and pulling this cord for 10 or 15 minutes, and it hasn't cranked yet. He said, well, oh, you got to cuss it when you pull the cord. You got to cuss at it, too. He said, son, I've been saved for years. I, I, I've forgotten how to do that. He said, well, just keep on pulling the cord. It'll come back to you. <laughs> and if anybody's played golf, you all know what that's like. <laughs> anyway, okay, we won't go there. No, everybody kept composure today. We had a good time. It was a good time on the golf course. First Timothy chapter 2. Um, I was working on our prayer sheet at our church about three or four weeks ago. And looking for some verses that would be applicable to prayer. And uh, Jessica was helping me. We were looking through some. And we came across this one. 
And man, was it a great passage. And it was kind of cool because I like it when the Lord shows you something kind of unexpectedly. I wasn't looking really to learn a lesson. I was just trying to get a verse to match with the thought and idea of prayer and came across this verse of scripture. And then I began to read it and study it after I used it where I wanted to in our prayer sheet. I began to go back and study it. And the Lord gave me some thoughts out of this. And that's what I want to share with you tonight. Um, when, I began to real, when I began to read it, I, I, of course, I realized right away something that made me look back. Look at verse 1. We'll read verse 1, and we'll go down to verse 5. And, uh, and then we'll have a word of prayer and get right into it. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. I exhort, therefore, there's the word. I exhort, therefore, that, first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions and giving of thanks be made for all men for kings and for all that are in authority that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior who will have all men to be saved and to come into the knowledge of the truth for there is one God and one mediator between God and men the man Christ Jesus who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time I want to talk about tonight, first of all, pray. First of all, pray. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you so much for letting us come to church tonight. It's a blessing to be here with the family of God. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to get up here and share some thoughts from your word. And I just pray that you would give me the words to say, give me the power to say it. Uh, I pray that you would capture our hearts and minds and help us to think and listen and hear what you have for us to hear tonight. Fill me with your spirit. Use me to be a blessing. Speak through me and uh, do something in our hearts that will change our hearts and change our minds about prayer. Please speak to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. It's clear when you read this that the Lord is using Paul to prepare Timothy for what he's going to be facing as a young pastor. And you know it's serious when the word warfare is used. You know it's going to be something pretty serious. So when you look at these verses of Scripture, let's see what the Lord is trying to teach us about Prayer. First of all, the principle of prayer. The principle of prayer. I exhort therefore. Now, when you see therefore, most Bible teachers will say, look back to see what it's there for. Uh, and that's a really good principle. So that's what I did. So I began to look back in chapter 1, and what I realized was it, really the whole chapter, the whole first chapter could to encapsulate the context of what he's saying in chapter 2. But there's really kind of a little bit of a transition beginning in verse 18. So look at verse 18, 19, and 20. This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy. Now we know who he's talking to. He's talking to Timothy. And we know that he uh, views Timothy as one of his sons in the faith. Uh, he's investing a lot into his life. And we know that as well. Whole, uh, he says, this charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, uh, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou might by them mightest war a good warfare. There, there he is. He said, listen, I'm giving you a charge. Uh, there is something that I've taught you. There's principles that we have uh, communicated. There's development that has taken place. I have been discipling and teaching and mentoring you. And I've been preparing you that thou by them mightest war a good warfare. And it's important for us to understand that when it comes in our spiritual life, that we are at a warfare with uh, the darkness of this world, with the, the prince of the power of the air, as the Bible talks about in Ephesians 6, that we are to put on the armor of God. We know all of that because there is a literal spiritual warfare. Now, we don't think about it in terms of being literal because of the spiritual aspect of it. We don't see it. We don't necessarily feel it sometimes. We don't hear it audibly, so we dismiss it. But the truth is we are in a spiritual warfare. And if we don't realize that, and if we don't get engaged in it, then oftentimes we can get overrun by it. So he's saying, listen, I'm giving you some principles that you can war a good warfare. Verse 19, holding faith and a good conscience, which some having put away concerning faith have made a shipwreck. Now, this is really interesting because notice what he's talking about. First of all, he talks about holding faith. In other words, the most important thing is having faith, faith in the word of God, faith in the, the God of the word, uh, the living and eternal God. But then he goes on to say, and a good conscience. Isn't that interesting that he says that? And then he goes on to talk about the effects of a bad one, which some having put away concerning faith have made shipwreck. And what he's saying here is almost, is basically that 
people who have their conscience defiled, people who allow their conscience to be uh, uh, dirtied or marred by the world or by sin or whatever, have a tendency and a propensity to walk away from their faith. And it's almost like he's saying you better be careful not only to just to have the right kind of faith that you need to have in God and his word, but you also need to have the right kind of motive on the inside that you're serving God, that you're living for God, that you have a relationship with God for the right reason. Because the danger is if you don't, as other people have, you may have a shipwreck in your own spiritual life. And then in verse 20, he talks about two people, of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. And isn't it interesting that he calls them by name? Imagine a, a pastor getting up in his church and say, hey, y'all need to watch out for Bill and John. And I don't know how many Bills and Johns are here. I'm just calling those names because they are big trouble. That's what he's doing here. He's calling them by name. Now, do y'all have the busted paper here in Florida? Up in Tennessee and Georgia, they have this busted paper. You know what I'm talking about? You see it in the gas station and everybody who gets arrested or whatever, there's their, there's their picture. And uh, it's kind of scary. How many of y'all ever seen somebody you know in them? Raise your hand. There's a few hands going up. Uh, I remember when I was working at a, uh, at a millwork uh, business company down in Ringgold, Georgia, one of my coworkers appeared in there. And I had to soon thereafter sit in on with the boss and, and see him get fired and be a part of that. But I'm just saying, that's bad enough. And they come out with an issue like what, every week or every two weeks, a new issue? Well, these guys' names are listed in the Bible, y'all. It's not going away. Hymenaeus and Alexander have been, been talked about for hundreds of years. It's a serious deal. And he says, listen, he, he calls them by name. And he says, these guys, I have turned them over to Satan that they'll learn not to blaspheme. It's a serious sin to blaspheme. And he calls them. So he's, he's teaching Timothy something here. So when you get down in verse 1 of chapter 2 and he says, I exhort therefore, he's saying this is why I'm about to say what I'm about to say because of what I just said in chapter 1, specifically that you may war a good warfare and that you may have a good faith and that you may have a good conscience because some people that don't have a good conscience like Hymenaeus and Alexander have made shipwreck. This is why the principle of prayer. And some people say, well, I know who Alexander is. He's, he's mentioned somewhere else in Scripture. And it could be we don't really know. Flip over to 2 Timothy, though, real quick, and let's look at Hymenaeus. He is mentioned, 2 Timothy chapter 2, look at verse 16, 17, and 18. Listen to what it says. 2 Timothy 2, 16. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness, and their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already and overthrow the faith of some. It's a serious issue when you get it, when you have people within the congregation who are teaching doctrine that is contrary to the word of God. And what he's saying here is it's so serious that I'm calling this guy out by name and here's what he's done. And it is affecting the relationship of God that some in the church have with the Lord. It's affecting them. It's causing some of them to fall away from the faith. It's causing some of them to go a wrong direction. And I'm telling you, you need to watch out for this. And then, you know, there's another passage, if you'll flip over to chapter 4 real quick. We, I don't know for sure if this is him. I looked at a couple of commentaries. They don't know. It could be this Alexander. We don't know. But look at 2 Timothy 4 and look at verse 14. Listen to what Paul says here in verse 14. Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works. Is it the same one? I don't know. But the fact is, that here's the case. There are people in a congregation that sometimes can cause a problem. And what, Paul, and what Paul is trying to warn Timothy or prepare Timothy for is that there is a literal spiritual warfare. And sometimes it involves even people within the congregation who have followed into a, or who are following someone who is, who is speaking a lie. And it's overthrowing their faith. So the principle of prayer. Well, here's the principle. There's some serious business that you may have to tend to. Now flip back to 1 Timothy chapter 2. We see the principle of prayer, but then we see the priority of it. Chapter 2, verse 1 of 1 Timothy. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, the priority of prayer. Now this is what I know that happens, a tendency of what would happen in a church. There's a couple of people making trouble, 
And what would happen is uh, a leadership would be notified or something, or a word would get around, and, and uh, maybe a deacon's meeting or a pastoral staff or vice versa, or, or, or both of them would be held. And they would say, okay, here's what's going on here. And this is what's happened. This is what they've said. This is the result of what has been said. And we're concerned about what to do here or whatever. And, and we're going to have a meeting and we're going to have a decision made about how to take care of it and what should we do with them and so forth and whatever. And what Paul is saying to Timothy is this, before you do anything else, you need to pray. I exhort, therefore, first of all, before you do anything with Hymenaeus and Alexander, if they come back around, before you do anything with so-and-so, or before you do anything, if there's a spirit in the church that is grieving the spirit of God, or, or if people are being affected by it, if there's anything that's going on, before you do anything, spend time in prayer. The priority of prayer. And the danger is that prayer gets overlooked because it's almost like we take it for granted that we should pray. And we take it for granted that people are praying when they're not. Um, a few months ago, I was teaching a lesson or preaching a message. I can't remember where I was doing it. I was talking to the church about prayer and how we sometimes have a tendency to say things like, I'll be praying for you. You know what I'm talking about? How many of you have ever said that and forgotten to pray? Raise your hand. Appreciate your honesty. Thank you for being honest. And I said, you know what, let's be careful not to say that if we're actually not going to do that. It's, we, we, sometimes we think because of the spiritual words there that we think that because we say, I'll be praying for you, that God hears that and says, consider it prayed. You know what I mean? It's almost like we think, hey, if I say that, it has been blessed in prayer because I have used that phrase. Isn't that true? But the fact is, we still have to pray. We still have to go to the Lord on their behalf. So instead of saying that, how about we do this? How about we stop immediately and pray with them there? Or let's pray for them and then tell them, I have already prayed for you. And you know what? That's a blessing to me because I've had a couple of people even this week text me and say, I have been praying for you. Or one of our deacons, he will text me every now and then, and it will say, you have been prayed for today. Now, that's a blessing because I know that he already did it. He's not just saying it to make me feel good or to make himself feel good. He's saying it because he already did it. And I'll say this about prayer. We need to be really careful. I need to be very careful that I don't throw that around as if it's something that means something if I don't actually do it. And he says, I exhort, therefore, that first of all, the priority of prayer. Number three, the practice of prayer. Well, how do you do it? Here it is in verse 1. Let's continue. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving thanks. Giving of thanks. Here's the practice of prayer. Here's how do you do it. Supplications is a word that talks about carrying requests to God. Uh, you know, the Bible uses different, there's different verses where that word is used, and it talks about what exactly, mentioning exactly what it is that you need. Supplication, And notice that he uses all these different forms, prayers, going to God, and worship, going to God, and thankfulness, going to God, and asking, going to God, and just praying and talking to him about how good he's been to you, or whatever the case may be. And then intercession. Intercession is like taking prayer to another level. Intercession is like, I am coming before you, Lord, on the behalf of John, and I'm coming because he really needs you, God or my daughter, or my son, or my wife, or whatever, or this, or this situation that so-and-so has shared with me, I'm coming to you on their behalf, and I am interceding for them in prayer. I'm not even thinking of me right now. I'm only thinking of them. So I am actually coming before you into your presence on their behalf, and I am interceding for them. It's kind of like what Jesus Christ does for us. When I go to the Lord in prayer and I say, God, I'm coming before you in the name of Jesus Christ, it's almost like he's sitting beside God and turns to God the Father and says, Lord, or, or Father, this is Chris, and he's coming before us with some requests. It's almost like that I'm doing that for someone else when I'm interceding for them. I, it's almost like I am carrying their burden to the Lord. When the Bible talks about bear you one another's burdens, that's kind of what he's talking about, doing something for someone. And prayer is one way to do that. I am, I am taking your request, and I am taking your burden, and I am taking your difficulty, and I'm taking that, the weightiness of the matter that you're struggling with, and I am taking that 
to God on your behalf. The practice of prayer, supplications, prayers, intercessions. And then he says, and giving of thanks. It's almost like the attitude of it. Make sure that when all is said and done, that you're grateful for the opportunity to pray. That you're, that when you pray and when you, you know what, when we think about how good God has been to us, it doesn't matter how difficult the situation is, we should always be able to say, and Lord, I just want to say thank you for how good you've been to me and my family. Just because I can even pray to you is a tremendous blessing, is a tremendous honor, it is, a, is, a, is a huge benefit to me and to my family, and to my church, and to our world. And I just want to say before I'm done, thank you for how good you've been. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. Thank you that there is a place that I can go and know that I'm getting the truth. You know what I mean? I don't have to have the Bible fact-checked. You know what I mean? I don't have to watch one of the news programs to see which one likes the Bible more. I go straight to the Word of God, and I know that it's all true. It's all good. I can depend on it. I can follow it. I can obey it and know for sure that it's right. Thank Him for His Word. Thank Him for His church. Thank Him for just the daily benefits of life that He gives us, food to eat, a place to sleep, all of those things. And He says, do all of those things and make sure that you do it. Also with giving thanks, the practice of prayer. And then he talks about the people of prayer. Notice how he finishes the verse. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. Who should be prayed for? Everyone. Everyone. You know what? It's interesting. In our, in our prayer sheet, someone made this request, so it's in our prayer sheet. Pray for the lost people in our community and all over the world. You know what I mean? And we take it for granted, but that's a great request. It really is, isn't it? God, I pray for everybody that's lost around the world that they'll be saved. Will they all be saved? No, because some are not going to believe. They just don't care. But shouldn't we pray for all? And that's what he's saying. Pray for all men. No one, no one should be avoided. No one should be ignored. Pray for all men, the people of prayer. Prayers and supplications and giving of thanks be made for all men. And then he goes on to say, for kings and for all that are in authority. He names them specifically. Specifically. Isn't that amazing that he names kings and all those that are in authority? I have heard a lot of people complain about our president. Well, that's typically the case with any president. But you know what I'm saying. But with this president in particular, and it's probably because there's a lot to complain about. Can I get an amen? I mean, everything is like, I mean, the economy's bad. You know, uh, national security's in question. The world's in chaos. I mean, everything's going bad. Everything's bad. Everything's negative. And everything's going the wrong direction. Everybody's got a complaint to say. Let me ask you something, though. How often do you pray for him? How often do you pray for him? Did you vote? And here's what I want to say real quick about voting. If you don't vote, you have no right to speak your mind. You have none. Because the fact you didn't cast a ballot means you have no opinion anyway. But second of all, before I complain, and if I complain, I sure hope that I'm going to God on his behalf. I sure hope that I'm praying, oh God, and I do. You know, I pray for him almost nightly. My daughters will tell you, we'll pray, God, we pray for the president, God, help him make good decisions. Help him to listen to wise people. And if he's not saved, save his soul. Bless his family. Whatever, you know what I'm saying? Pray for him. Pray for him. Kings. We don't have a king, but that's the equivalent for us. And all those that are in authority, the governors, the, the senators, the congressmen, both state and federal, whatever. Pray for all those, you know, all the people. And they were talking about Sunday about school board members and, and things of that nature. The local government, how important it is and so forth. And God knows that. And he names all men, but he specifically says everyone that's in authority, both in the government side of things, but also in the church side of things. Pray for all the leadership. Pray for deacons. Pray for pastoral staff. Pray for Sunday school teachers. Pray for bus captains. You know what I'm saying? Anyone. Pray for them. Pray for them. The people of prayer and then the purpose of prayer. Well, what's the purpose? Well, there's a couple he mentions here specifically. Look at verse 2. For kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. Now listen to that. Here's the reason. We need to live a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. That's what God desires for us. 
He says, pray for those that are in authority because I want you to have a quiet and peaceable life that's also godly and honest. What a great country that would be. Wouldn't it? What a great country it would be to have the peace and have the quiet. And then that's kind of like the external. You know what I mean? That's the outward part of our, of our life, the, the quiet and peaceable living, which is great. But then he talks about the internal, godliness and honesty. Imagine politicians who speak the truth, who speak the truth. Imagine people that are in authority, uh, w- whether it be uh, local or high up in federal offices, who speak the truth. Imagine people in the workplace speaking the truth. Imagine your fellow employees or your employer just being honest. Imagine the people in the church just being honest. That's what so, that is what's so refreshing to me about the Bible is that God is being honest with me. And sometimes it's very hard, isn't it? Sometimes it's very hard. The Bible says that when you look in the Word of God, it's like looking into a mirror. And when I look into a mirror, it says it's like a natural man beholding himself in a glass. And you know what? I have a decision to make when I do that. I either shut it and run away and, and not ever look again, or I look and let God begin to work in me and change my life. Honesty. He mentions those two things, quiet and peaceable life, the outward, and all godliness and honesty, the inward, the purpose of prayer. But then we see the pleasure of prayer. Look at verse 3, the pleasure of prayer. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God and our Savior. This is what God wants for us. God wants us to not only live and experience that kind of life, but he wants us to pray. And he goes on to talk about what's good and acceptable. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God and our Savior. Uh, flip over to 1 John 5 real quick, and we'll, we'll come back there in just a second. First John chapter 5, and look at verse 14 and 15. We love verse 13, and I use it often, and it's a great verse to, to go to to share someone uh, the truth about how they can know for sure that they're saved and that God wants us to know. Verse 13, these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that ye may know that ye have eternal life and that ye may may believe on the name of the Son of God. Verse 14, and this is the, notice the word, confidence that we have in him that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. Verse 15, notice the word, and if we know that he hear us, whatsoever we ask, notice the word, we know that we have the petitions that we desired him. Isn't that great? Isn't it good to know that you can go to God and he, we can say, I know you hear me. You know what we should do when we pray? We should conclude our prayer with God, thank you for hearing me. Thank you for listening to me when I pray. Because you know when you close in prayer and you say that, what you're saying is that I am reassuring myself that everything that I just said meant something. That there was a real, eternal, living God who heard what I just said. And I can go ahead before he answers it and say, thank you, God, for hearing me. Thank you for hearing me, for this is good. Flip back over to 1 Timothy chapter 2. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, the pleasure of prayer. Number seven, the passion of prayer. Listen to this. The verse continues. Who will have all men to be saved and to come into the knowledge of the truth, the passion of prayer. I want to say something real quick. There are a few verses, there are quite a few verses, and this is a great one, that would dispel the thought, uh, the conversation of the Calvinists, or whatever you want to call those folks. There's different words because some of them refer to themselves to Reformed theologians or Reformed theology or whatever, but I think the, the doctrine kind of is very similar to being a Calvinist. But there are verses of Scripture like verse 4 to me that clearly dispel that. When the Bible says, who will have all men, talking about God, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth if there was such a thing as as God electing and and choosing and predestinating and all of those things, uh, people to heaven and to hell or whatever the case may be, if, if there was a confusion about it, well, here's some clarity, right? Right here in verse four, here's some clarity. It's like God says, by the way, you should know this about me. And that's what his word is, really, and that's what it's all about anyway, is God revealing himself to us. Here's what he wants us to know about him, and what he says here is, who will have all men to be saved? God wants everybody to be saved. 
He wants everybody to be saved. And he wants everybody to be saved so bad that he came and died, suffered, was our substitute, shed his blood, and died on a cross and was and risen again on the third day. Why? So all men who will can be saved. That's how much he wants everybody to be saved. Who will have all men to be saved and come into the knowledge of the truth, the passion of prayer. I think the heart of God is represented in this verse. I think we see the heart of God. And I think he lists a few reasons to pray, but praying for the lost tops the list. I think it tops the list. I mean, uh, fl- I thought of Romans 10 real quick. You don't have to flip over there. I thought of Romans 10, 1 in reference to this. It says in Romans chapter 10, Verse 1, brethren, Paul talking, but the Lord obviously through Paul, brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. That was his heart. That was his passion. That's what he prayed for. Matter of fact, he said, I could wish myself a little curse for my kinsmen according to the flesh for their sake. I would rather be without Christ and they know Christ. That's how bad I want to see them saved. And I'll say this about prayer. The suggestion is not that everyone will be saved, but that everyone needs to be saved. I thought about this when I was reading Wearsby on this. This is what he said. This does not mean all people without exception, for certainly the whole world is not going to be saved. It means all people without distinction, Jews and Gentiles, rich and poor, religious and pagan. It means they all need to be saved. It means that we should go after the people that are the wealthy people, And we should go after the people who would not be able to even attend here unless someone picked them up in a bus or a van. It means they all need to be saved. It means that someone in Hawaii, and it means someone in Africa, and it means someone in China. They all need to be saved. We all need it. And that's what he's saying here. And this is the passion of prayer. The passion and priority of our prayer life should be measured by our burden for lost souls. It is our burden for the lost that will drive us to prayer and to remain in prayer until we are confident that God has answered or heard us. My pastor made a comment a couple of weeks ago that really got my attention. He said that we spend more time praying people out of heaven than we do out of hell. You know what he means by that? We pray more for people that are saved and that are sick than we do that are people that are lost and on their way to hell. Is that not true? Listen, I can, uh, Jessica has my prayer, the prayer sheet from my home church. I put a, we put a section in there for lost people, and uh, unless it's changed, last week there was three people. And you flip to the other side of the page, and there's about 25 on a cancer prayer list. You see what I'm talking about? Where, why, is our, why is our passion in our prayer life off? Why, why is that? You know why it is? Because we feel like we're okay. We're okay. You know what, I'll be honest with you. I've talked to Jessica about this because cancer is in our family, my dad's side of the family for sure. I, it's almost like I'm just waiting for when I get it. You know what I mean? Uh, and I'm not trying to be a, you know, negative. I'm just trying to be a realist. If I know Christ, and if I'm saved, and if I'm going to heaven, then there's surely there's some grace and peace there. And I'm not saying if I get cancer that I'm just going to say, oh, well, I'm not going to get treatment or go see a doctor. I don't mean that. But I sure hope that my desire and the brokenness in my heart and the passion for my prayer sometimes should be about lost people instead of just trying to pray for all those that are saved that are physically struggling. And and God is saying here, who will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth? Christ, God himself, he wants all men to be saved. Do we pray like that? Do we, do we ask in our Sunday school class, pray for my son, daughter, niece, nephew, cousin, uncle, aunt, mom, dad, pray for them. And do we say it over and over and over again? Do we remind people? Do we remind people over and over and over again? And I'm going to raise my hand and say, no, I don't. But I should. Because I know this, prayer makes a huge difference in regards to people getting saved. You know, it used to be people came to church to get saved. You know what I mean? I mean, you'd hear back in the day, people walk the aisle all the time to get saved. And in in many churches, they still do. But in many churches, they don't. You know why I believe? Because people aren't praying for people to be saved like they used to. I don't believe that on Saturday night, people are even thinking about it. 
I don't think that on Sunday morning, you know what, what's, what one of the things that I, encourages my heart when, when Dwight, our pastor, gets up at the end of the service, he says, I want everyone to bow their head and close their eyes. And he says, Christians, I want you all to pray. He says at every service, Christians, pray. Please pray right now, especially if there's someone here that's lost. The only thing that's going to help someone get saved is that if we go to God on their behalf and just pray to God that he will use the circumstances of life, whatever the case may be, send someone their way. Do something in their life to bring God to the forefront of their mind and their heart. And then when they walk into this church on Sunday or Sunday morning or night or on Wednesday night, that they sense the presence of God, that the conviction, and that's the key, the convicting power of the Holy Spirit just grabs their heart and they feel like they better walk the aisle now or they won't have another chance. You know where that comes from? Prayer. Prayer. But I think that oftentimes we pray more for Christians than we do for lost people. And there's nothing wrong with praying for Christians, not in, not in your life. There's nothing wrong with that. But the passion of our prayer, and I think the heart of God, is for the lost. Number eight, and I'm done, the provision for prayer. Look at verse five and verse six. Well, here's a provision for it. Listen to this. For there is one God. I mean, that's a great theological truth right there, right? I mean, some people think that there's all kinds of gods out there. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Well, that's good. I don't go to Jesus. I, don't, I mean, I don't go to the Father any other way except the name of Jesus Christ. That's it. There is no other way, right? Jesus said himself, his own words. They're in red if you have a red letter edition. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. He's the only way. And when we come before him in prayer, he said, listen, there's one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. So first of all, we see we have our representative, our representative, Jesus Christ. Could you get a better representative than that? You know, we have representation in the state of Tennessee. We have state senators and we have we have a, a, a Congress, and then we have those that go to Washington, and we vote and we pick on, you know, and there's commercials all over TV. Aren't y'all going to be glad when those are gone? Yeah. Hey, man, so-and-so supports your families, and so-and-so doesn't, and so-and-so, you know, likes to cut the grass a certain height, and someone doesn't like cutting grass at all, and someone's for clean water, and someone's for dirty water, and whatever. I'm glad when that's over with. But you know what? We have some really good we have one uh, senator that's really good. Our governor's a pretty good guy. He's a pretty good guy. I mean, he really is. We had a congressman for years named Zach Womp. Strong Christian guy. Good guy. But you know what? None of those compare to Jesus Christ. None of them. And he says, listen, when you come to God the Father, there's one person that takes you into the presence of God, and that's Jesus Christ. He is the mediator between God and man. There was a gap between God the Father and men that could not be made up for by any of our human efforts. Jesus Christ, when he died on the cross to pay for my sin, made a bridge the gap so now I can go to the Father through Jesus Christ, our representative. But then we see our ransom who gave himself, verse 6, a ransom for all to be testified in due time. You know what a ransom, a good definition of it is? I looked it up. A price paid to free a slave. Isn't that good? And it's like Jesus is saying, you know what? I, I, uh, he is a good representative to go to God, if for no other reason, because he made the way so I could go to heaven. He paid the price that I could have never paid. He did it for me in my place. He ransomed, he paid our ransom. And because of that, because of that, he's our representative. He's a provision for prayer. Jesus Christ is. Here's the conclusion, and I'm done. Does prayer fall first in line among any of my priorities? Do I pray first thing in the morning? Do I pray before going to bed at night? Do I pray first before I eat? You know, that means something. And I'm not saying that because sometimes it can be flippant. But I'll give you an example of this. Just a couple, uh, about a month ago, I guess it was, Emerson, she's our six-year-old. They go to uh, Hickson Elementary School, public school, and she came home and she said um, that she was praying over her food and her friend in class said she didn't know how to pray. So Emerson was trying to teach her how to pray. And then she said, even though I'm not saved, you know, which was kind of funny because she's been talking about getting saved and, you know, trying to be real careful about how she understands and is the Lord dealing with her heart, you know, and not trying to push it on her and so forth or whatever. 
But you know what? Uh, and matter of fact, I ended up getting a leader to Christ that night. She set her down because I could tell, hello, she's getting a little paranoid about not being saved. It's bothering her. So I talked to her and tenderhearted and just listened and, and, uh, and asked her questions. And she understood and she bowed her head and, and just asked Christ to save her and put her faith in it. It was great. And she's going to get baptized soon. But you know what? Just because she was praying at school over lunch, she had an opportunity to tell her little first grade classmate about God. That's convicting, isn't it? That's convicting. But you know what? I, was, I worked for AT&T the last couple of years. And that's what I would take to my, I would take my lunch to work sometimes. Or when we worked at certain stores, we worked together with other, with other uh, associates. And I would pray over my lunch. And uh, this one s certain lady that I work with oftentimes, her name was Janet, um, she would always ask me to pray. And one time I got food and I bought us, and if you ever want customers at a store, just go buy something to eat and bring it back and all their customers come in. I'm just saying. Uh, so she was dealing with a customer and it was just the one customer. And I, I started eating, so I went ahead and prayed and I was eating my lunch. She comes over there and she's like, uh, had you already prayed? I said, yeah, I already prayed. She said, will you pray again? Okay. It matters to people. Especially if you pray with the attitude that someone is listening. Or if you say, hey, is there anything I can pray for you about? You would be, a, you would be amazed at the demeanor and the attitude that changes on people if you say, hey, can I pray for you for something? Because you know what? Prayer is so often viewed as a selfish act that people do that's a religious exercise that's very personal and no one, you know, interfere. So when you go to someone and you say, hey, can I pray for you? Is there something I can pray for you? It's almost like you're taking weight off their back. Matter of fact, you know what? You say, well, it doesn't have an impact. My boss texted me or called me this week and, uh, and said, hey, Janet, she just found out her best friend has cancer and she wants you to call her. It has an impact, y'all. It makes a difference. So do I pray before I eat? Do I pray first after being asked by someone before moving on to something else? Do I pray, do I pray first before I come to church? For the pastor, for the music, for everyone that's serving in different aspects of the ministry, for myself? Do I pray first before I make a big decision? Or do I make the big decision and ask for God to bless it? Do I pray first for others before I pray for myself? First of all, pray. Listen to this verse. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, and intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. First of all, pray. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for your word. It's very, very convicting to me. And I would say I would agree with many, many Christians much, much greater than I that it's the hardest discipline to learn, but it is the, definitely the most rewarding. Forgive me, God, for not setting aside more time to pray. And also, thank you that we can pray anytime. We can. We can pray on the phone with someone. We can pray standing in the church with someone. We can pray with our neighbor across the street, standing in their yard. We can pray anytime, anywhere. Thank you, because you made that possible, Jesus. Thank you for that. But I just pray, God, that you would break our hearts and show us that we have a wonderful opportunity and a wonderful privilege, and not only that, we are commanded to come to you in prayer. Pray without ceasing, you said. And that just means, God, for us to stay in an attitude of prayer, that our life should be lived in such a way that we should not have to spend 30 minutes confessing sin, to come before you in prayer. That when we get that text message or that email or that phone call or that short conversation that we can stop immediately and just pray. There's nothing greater in all the world we can do for people than pray. God, help us to learn this. Help us to be better prayer warriors because there's no doubt, God, that we are in a spiritual warfare. We sure do need you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Great introduction to our prayer time, and uh, so we're going to go right into prayer time. If you have a request uh, that you need Brother Steve or Brother uh, Dave to pick up, do that, and I'm going to give you several to pray for. Uh, continue to pray uh, for the request, and, and so many times you look at your prayer sheet, 
and it's just full of names. We're actually in the process of changing that so you can know better how to pray uh, for specific needs. But uh, I was thinking while he was preaching, you know, uh, I mentioned two weeks in a row a young man that's been in our service and is lost. His name is John, and uh, I talked to his wife and uh, mother-in-law this week, and uh, they said that he came home from church Sunday and told his wife, he said, you know, we, we need to read our Bible, and we need to, we need to do something more. Uh, here's a guy that's not yet saved, but he's already seeing, feeling that. So let's pray for John to come to faith in Christ, and Lord willing, we'll try to win him to Christ, if not before Sunday, see him saved on Sunday. Uh, but uh, let's pray for him, uh, let's pray for others, and of course, uh, so many that you know. Uh, there's a little booklet out, I don't know if you've seen it, but it's a little book called Praying Effectively for the Lost. Any of you ever read that little booklet, Praying Effectively? I preached a series, and in fact, uh, I think it's about 10, 11 chapters, I preached a, a series on how to pray for lost people, and uh, I think that's a great truth. Uh, what a convicting truth. We spend more time praying people uh, out of heaven, Lord, heal so-and-so, fix so-and-so, than praying for people that are bound for hell, so let's remember that. Um, Pray for Peggy tonight. She's not here. Peggy's always here and not feeling well. Uh, pray for Joan May. This is Rachel's mother, and uh, the cancer uh, is uh, in her. She has breast cancer, and tomorrow is the scheduled surgery. And so they're going to go in at 8 30 more. So uh, this is a sweet lady. Many of you know her. She's been down many times with Rachel, and Rachel's still up there. So pray for her. Lori Hall is homesick tonight. Pray for her. Had a good chance to see Adam Rampersod yesterday. Uh, Adam uh, has lost so much weight. If you knew Adam before he got sick, you, you know he didn't have much weight to lose, but he was in the store uh, and just, just skin as a, uh, skinny as a rail. But he's doing great. He said, preacher, he said, I feel better. He's going back to work. He's through his treatments. and uh, he's, He said, I'm finally able to drink and eat a little bit. So it looks like he's on the mend. So let's praise the Lord for that. Uh, but keep praying for him and for his recovery. Uh, Deb Schroeder's family, that's a very difficult situation. Uh, Brother Rick, appreciate what you did this week. I know that was very try trying uh, to try to deal with that, but pray for Deb's family. And uh, then also, uh, listen, as we pray, first let's praise the Lord for the good offering. We, we praise the Lord for the good offering. And uh, then remember these requests. Uh, Joan Conti is going to have a procedure surgery tomorrow. John Conti, I was about to say, you look great, John, good for you. Uh, but John's going to have a uh, procedure tomorrow, blood clots. So John just continues uh, to deal with situation there. Beverly Stevens is continuing to pray for that precious little granddaughter, great granddaughter, great granddaughter. And uh, she is out in Washington State. And uh, so pray for her, uh, just uh, the mother, that whole situation. Christy Milliken, uh, supervisor, has got a brother on life support. And uh, Christie's uh, health situation, uh, there's been some, uh, some changes there, and she's waiting on some results. So let's pray for Christy and uh, the word there. Uh, Sheila uh, Flint's praying for uh, Joy B Bynum, uh, family, funeral tomorrow, 30-year-old son killed Sunday. Wow. Where are you at? 30-year-old son killed unexpectedly, obviously. Okay, pray for that family. That's devastating, 30 years old. Pray for uh, Noel's husband, Dwayne, salvation. Uh, he, he's doing good, y'all. He's coming to church. There's been some change. Uh, he, he, he just needs to confess Christ at this point. And they keep praying for, for Noel. Linda's praying uh, for an adult son of a work acquaintance who uh, took his own life, married with two children. Married with two children. So, uh, Linda, this is a, a friend of yours at work. Is that right? Okay, and uh, Linda certainly can understand this and maybe minister there. Let's pray for Linda and I pray for this family. Uh, Susan Epperson has several requests. Uh, her aunt is uh, having some issues and uh, possibly uh, not sure of her salvation. And so she put on there to pray for that. And then Paula's got a friend, Mary Thompson, um, life support uh, for a family friend, Miss Alice. And uh, so let's pray for this. Uh, very sick, obviously. And then Connie Myers' family, let's pray for that. 
and then uh, Steve Hart. You know, he, you don't see Steve on Sunday morning because he's ministering in one of our nursing home ministries, Sunday morning services at Arbor Oaks. And um, there's a lady that's been faithful, faithful the whole time that uh, Steve has been preaching over there at Arbor Oaks. And her name is Helen, and she's very near the end of her life. And uh, Steve is burdened for her son, John. Now, it's not the same John that we're praying for on the other end, but John's salvation. And uh, Steve got a chance to talk to him the other day, but uh, son, John. So let's pray uh, for this uh, family, uh, Helen nearing the end, but also John's salvation. Helen's saved. Steve believes Helen's saved, but don't know about the son's salvation. All right. How many of you have an unspoken, something just heavy? Boy, I tell you, uh, you don't come to church without... Uh, a burden sometimes. I have a praise, had a wonderful prayer request answered today, and uh, rejoicing over God's goodness, just thankful when the Lord answers prayer. And uh, you pray for Chris and Jess, they're going to pull out tonight and uh, go a little ways up the road before uh, heading back in Chattanooga to get back to, to uh, Calvary. If you're ever in Chattanooga, that's a good church. Pastor Dwight uh, is a good man. You went to college with him, and he's doing a good job there. And the Lord's blessing there in Red Bank, Tennessee, right outside of Chattanooga. All right, let's have our, if you're physically able, I'd invite you if you can. Greg, I want you to come tonight and pray. Uh, Greg got to hear some good preaching tonight, I'm glad. What a blessing. But uh, Greg, you come pray for us. We're always glad to have uh, Greg, of course, founder of Restore Ministries and all that he's done for us over the years. And uh, he's got some things in his life. Uh, they're transitioning right now, new, new direction in ministry. And uh, so Greg's going to lead us in prayer. And, of course, he's been here helping us get moved into the house. Just a few more weeks on that. We're leaving for Haiti uh, in a couple of days. We'll be, uh, a couple, excuse me, not this week, but next week. Uh, we'll be going back in to dedicate uh, Macedonia Christian School and Baptist Church. And I'll be preaching there in a conference uh, for pastors all over Haiti. And uh, so you pray for that. And the Lord would give us great opportunity. Also, uh, in preaching in a foreign country, the translation is always so important. You get a good translator. And so uh, pray with us about that. We'll be leaving here uh, next week. And then I'll be in revival next week, preaching revival. So you pray uh, for me. I'll be preaching about uh, 10, 11, 12 times the next few days. So uh, just pray about that. And uh, then let's pray for Sunday. Boy, wouldn't it be great? I know we have two scheduled to be baptized. And what a blessing, Brother Rick. Praise the Lord. But uh, we have two scheduled to be baptized Sunday at least. And uh, let's pray that John would be saved uh, either before Sunday uh, or Sunday. All right? Brother Greg, you come and pray for us, please. Let's pray. Lord, after the sermon the, this evening, it seems like a uh, man was over, overwhelmed with remorse and, and guilt for the, for the way I've treated my, my prayer life in the past few months. And Lord, you definitely spoke to me and convicted me the, the idea that we tend to pray people out of heaven more than we do out of hell was just an amazing thought to me and I realize it's true in my own life and Lord I, I ask you to forgive me for that you bless us so much you do so much for us and yet I guess nine times out of ten we talk to you we're asking for something else or worried about something that you haven't showed us you've already taken care of and, and Lord tonight we want to we want to praise you we want to start by praising you for the offering last Sunday um, Lord uh, so much of the ministry here at the church in some way is, is related to finances, and so often you, you get tired of asking for finances from the pulpit, and you get tired of worrying about finances when you're meetings, and, and as church members, we get tired of always hearing somebody asking us for more finances, but Lord, I, I so appreciate the, the attitude in which the need was brought to this church and the attitude in which the people gave, and the attitude of this person who who offered uh, finances to double the money, and Lord, it's, it excites me and encourages me. It lets me know that your hand is at work here and that you have a you have an active work going on here. Lord, I thank you so much for that. As the decisions are made on this, how to spend that money, I pray that you'll stretch that money that you've provided and give wisdom to preacher and the men as they decide on what to do with it, how best to turn the cube into the classrooms that need done and and uh, put the kitchen in, all because we want to see more people on this property so that more people hear the gospel, more Christians can grow, and and St. Petersburg gets changed a little bit more towards towards you. I right, thank you for the 
for the spirit, for the giving. Thank you for the wonderful offering. Lord, thank you for the the day we had, the fall here, and the humidity's gone a little bit. It just seemed like things just moved a little quicker today. Thank you for the uh, attitude that, uh, that the fall weather brings, the oppressive heat gone. Lord, I don't know a lot of the prayer requests discussed tonight from this pulpit, and most of the people's names, I don't, I don't know them by name, but I know there's a, a lot of folks that do have physical needs. Lord, we understand that life is unchanged for a Christian versus a safe person as far as our physical health. And so I pray that you'll provide peace in situations that need peace, provide healing in situations where your, your glory can be shown by the healing. Or if it's just strength and patience that needs given, give that both to the persons that's sick and to those taking care of them. Well, we've heard uh, so many times this young man mentioned who's been going through his treatment and chemo. Lord, I pray that you, you'll give him some extra boost of energy and peace and calmness as he starts back to work and starts back to life here. I pray that you'll uh, bless his parents for their faithful attitude that they've had about that. And Lord, we, we've discussed the, the things that we're supposed to talk about first in, ch- in prayer this evening. And so we want to make sure we, we talk about the people in our community that are unsaved, people that are here in this town that we already have relationships with that this church has reached out to and, and you've put us in contact with and we're already working with them and those we haven't yet. I pray that you'll give us a burden for those people individually, personally, and then as a community, collectively, I pray that you'll remember that that's why the church is here. It's the only reason that this building was ever built in the first place. It's the only reason Pastor Stancil is the pastor. It's the only reason the staff are here. It's the only reason we're here tonight is because we're trying to give as much glory to you as we can through sharing what you've done for us with all the people. Lord, help us to keep that always in front of us. Never let us forget it. Bless the travels of preacher over the next few days, the travels to Haiti in the next, in the next week. Lord, I pray that you just help us to make sure that we're doing exactly what you want us to do, the way you want us to do it with the right attitude so that we can glorify you. We love you and praise you. Thank you for all your blessings. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let me give you a ministry spotlight tonight for one of our missionaries, uh, Jerry and Kristen Hickey. And uh, Brother Dory, are you uh, ready for that? Do you have that? Come on up. And uh, we have one change. If you're emailing our missionaries, uh, they want to make a note. Uh, Their account got hacked. So they have a new account. Brother David, let's correct that on the website if we can. Already taken care of that? All right. But uh, jerry.hickey at bbfmissions.org. But uh, Brother Dory, come and tell us a little bit about what's going on in Brazil. Thank you, Pastor. This letter is from the uh, Hickeys in Brazil, and they uh, relate to its factory ministry. Interesting. A weekly factory ministry in the neighboring city of Campo Lago is started under the Bible study in the home of a young couple. Uh, we believe the Lord will have us implement a new church through the factory ministry. One of the seminary students from Pem- Templo Batista Biblico will be teaching the Crown Financial Course and holding weekly devotions at the factory, praying that a new church would uh, uh, come about by that. Uh, they speak of ordination of the, go- of the gospel ministry. Two men out of our first work will be examined in preparation for their ordination in May. Both have already finished their seminary training and have proven themselves in the ministry full time. Luis has already been called to pastor a church about 40 minutes away. They are meeting in rented facilities, but are awaiting the approval of their plan from the city to build a building of their own. David, baptized by me when he was just a young boy, will stay on there as a youth director and the worship leader. Templo Baptista Biblical Church, I recently had the privilege of presenting a gospel to over 100 people at a wedding I performed. 13 converts from there and baptized at a wedding. Praise the Lord. Good Hope Baptist Church, uh, please pray for the second church we started. It is in need of a pastor. Uh, President Pastor Osmar has selected to be known after four years as pastor. He will be resigning by the end of the year. Our health. Uh, Our state has registered 14 deaths so far from the H1N1 flu. Most clinics in our state have run out of the vaccine to prevent it. Christian and I caught a bad flu recently, but not the deadly one. 
We did require a trip to the hospital emergency room, which put us out of commission for about three weeks with fever, headaches, chills, and so forth. So pray for their health, and of course, continue to pray for ministry there in Brazil. Thank you, Pastor. Hear reports in Brazil, that's such a, a large place, you, you, don't, you don't recognize just how big Brazil is uh, until you fly through there, as Byron and I did on a mission trip one time. Uh, just a tremendous amount of area. And uh, you think Brazil, you think Amazon. But then you also think Rio and Sao Paulo, some of these huge metropolitan places, uh, millions and millions of people. And then you do go up into uh, the, the jungle, and I mean, it's just uh, as primitive as it can possibly be. So great place. And just consider all these people that are one to Christ. Now they can go out and reach their own culture. And as you pray for the hick, he's been on the field a long, long time, and we rejoice over that. All right, let's have our good ushers come. And while they're coming, I'll make a couple of announcements. We have our fall festival, November the 17th, and this is really geared uh, for our Bible club. And our Bible club's down in the second week. We had over 90 kids last week in Bible clubs, and uh, everybody's invited, all the church family, to come out Saturday, November the 17th. From 10 to 2, it'll be over in the front parking lot here, and we'll have all kind of games. Uh, we're looking for donations, candy, hot dog, drinks. There's a sign-up sheet in the usher's table. If you can work or sign up to bring food or any of those things they need for that. And then also, let me remind you, this Friday is our ladies' prayer group, 10 o'clock. Come and pray together. And then our breakfast club is Tuesday, uh, 9.30. Be a part of that. Still have calendars and Christmas cards available uh, through the uh, seniors. And I see Brother Warren for that. And keep working on your greater vision tickets, uh, November 24th. Bring somebody with you. Let's have a great night that night. And that kicks off our Jubilee uh, with Dr. Hamlin, Dr. Uh, Sexton, and Brother Joe Arthur. going to be a great time here at Community. All right? Let's pray together, shall we? Father, uh, we rejoice over the offering. We rejoice over soul saved. Folks have been uh, in discipleship. We thank you for what we saw in ministry this week. Lord, we're anxious to hear tonight of the reports of what has happened in the other parts of the building. We know, Lord, we were challenged to pray tonight. And I'm under ter terrible conviction, uh, Lord, about the condition of my prayer life and then also what I pray for in my prayer life. And so, Lord, I pray you'd help me to remember uh, this first priority. Bless the gift. Bless the offering. Continue the ministry here in greater days and ways. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you as you give. Thank you, Miss Beaton. What a blessing. Uh, we've had at least three saved since Sunday uh, in ministry. So praise the Lord for that. Tomorrow night at 7 o'clock, uh, we have RU. Now, let me tell you, many of you don't come, but pray for us. Uh, we are having the best time. And if you're looking for a time to come, study the Word of God and see real ministry, uh, get involved in people's lives. Last week, we had uh, our fourth week in a row with first-time visitors, people coming in and hearing about the Word of God and how the truth will make you free. And I had a lady last week uh, during the group time. We, we, we try to begin to deal with whatever the habit or the issue is, but we want to get to the gospel. And uh, during group time, it, it became evident that this lady was not sure of her salvation. And after the third talk, uh, Miss Deanna Bell took her Bible and led this lady to Christ and just tears of repentance. I mean, it was a wonderful time. And she's getting ready to be baptized and just thrilled. She was in church Sunday, uh, sitting over here to my right Sunday. Uh, a man named Brian and Becky, they've been the last two or three weeks to RU. And uh, that was their first Sunday to be in church. And uh, just seeing some really neat things. Uh, now, I took a time while Chris was in his introduction and early part of the message. I took a time to walk through the building. And, uh, you know, 
there is tremendous preaching going on all over this building. And uh, it is just exciting to hear and to say, I don't get to do it because I'm in here. And uh, you don't get to do it because you're in here as well. But uh, to see Brother Tyler, if you've never seen somebody just gifted in front of young people. And I went upstairs to Brother Paul, and they were having pizza. And I'm thinking, what goes on up here? Today is Paul's ninth anniversary as a staff member at Community Bible Baptist Church. So let's do this. Let's make sure that we... Uh, if you see him tonight or you see him Sunday, let's congratulate him for nine years as faithful. Listen, as an assistant, nine years, that's, that's like a hundred years in a normal assistant pastor years, all right? And uh, just a blessing. So nine years, and uh, we rejoice over that. So Sunday or tonight if you see him. But uh, he was getting ready to preach up there. He, he said, I promise we're just having fun now. They'll be preaching in a minute. And then uh, Brother Hurst preaching there in Spanish. Don't understand the word, but just say amen and smile. Amen, amen, amen. And then uh, to see all the Master Club kids. And when I went up there, they were breaking down little age groups. You got the little first and second graders and third and fourth and all the way up and hearing the word of God. But one of my favorite times, I love the bus, I love the wow, I love all the other programs. But seeing about 25 bus teenagers. Now this is totally separate from the little kids. But Brother Leaf, down here in this part of the building, bus teenagers. Say, preacher, is that important? Well, you know, about six weeks or two months ago, one of our bus teenagers arrested as part of murder, uh, a murder conspiracy. Listen, very important that we reach these kids. And I was talking to Paul this week, talking to Tyler. We want to expand our Bible clubs and get into the junior highs and the senior highs as well. Uh, we want to try our best to do what we can to reach these kids for the street uh, gets hold of them and eats them up. So uh, if you appreciated Brother Chris's message on prayer, uh, go by and spend some time. Get to say hello to him. They're going to head out to Lake City tonight before heading on into Chattanooga. The best way to travel with four little girls under the age of eight is at night. Amen. And how much farther, how much farther. So they're going to head on up the road and uh, pray for them. All right, any other announcements that I've forgotten? Let's all stand together. And uh, Miss Beaton is going to play us out. Go by and shake hands with somebody. Fellowship for just a little bit. Be careful in the parking lot. Watch for the children. God bless you. We love you. You're dismissed. <laughs>